Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scenes tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. The time has come for your firm to begin gathering product and material information for its next project. Let's say you're tasked with finding the top gas fireplace manufacturers, and they need to have CAD, BIM, and specifications. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a search engine that showed you who has the data you need? There is. And it's ArcCat.com, the number one most used website for finding building product information, search for a product, or even a CSI section, and get a list of manufacturers and the data they offer. Even better, you can download all that Technica data for free. You don't even have to register to use ArcCat. Save your firm time, money, and frustration, and go to ArcCat.com to start building better content today. That's A R C A T. Dot com. Arcat.com. Larry Sharp, welcome to Inside the Firm Podcast. So happy to have you here. You're, I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time about business. Welcome. Glad to have you. Thank you. It's going to be very disappointing, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so tell everybody uh, who doesn't know who you are about your business background and kind of what you do as a business coach. I will coach. not be boring whatsoever. I was a Marine when I was 17 years old. When I left the Marine Corps after seven years, I became an English teacher. Then I became a sales rep for many years. I decided to help my parents out, so I started a business. Entrepreneur for a couple of times, uh, was a consultant for the past 15 years, taught at a couple of schools, the graduate level of uh, Yale and Columbia. My first business that I ever tried back in 2001 failed. I sold it off. Then I had this one in 2004. This one collapsed in 2008. I rebuilt it after the crash, and now I'm rocking and rolling here. I am a trainer, a teacher, a consultant. I coach um, whatever someone needs when it comes to anything emotional communication to include sales, branding, small business growth. But my biggest thing right now, believe it or not, is leadership, particularly what I've been teaching for a while, post-industrial leadership. Tell us about what that is because, to me, that's a new term. Um, so, it is. You know, I made it up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. We do that right. all the time on this podcast and the business that we run. We're always making stuff up, especially terms. So what does that mean to you? What is post? Say it again one more time. Sure. It's post-industrial leadership. Right now, sadly, if you've been to an MBA recently, um, they teach you things like, look, the best answer is to make sure you have the right plan. Details matter. That's all garbage. That was true back in you know 1960, maybe, when we were an industrial uh, country. We're not anymore. We're in post-industrial country, which means I don't need your arms and legs anywhere near as much as I used to. It means uh, your ability to learn things and know, I mean, sorry, to know things is no longer as important as your ability to learn things. Things change so quickly, the knowledge you had 10 years ago is almost useless now. Not just that, things change so quickly. I need you to be the person who can jump through hoops and change and adjust and shift. I need your innovation. I need your initiative. I need your leadership. I need your communication far more than your arms and legs. And the only way that I get that is through buy-in, through you wanting to be on my team, for you wanting to do as I say, for us having common goals, common ground, and you wanting to be here. If I get that, then I get all of your intellect, all of your knowledge, all of your experience, which is what I require. Because if, I, if you don't give me that, then I'll replace you either with arms and legs I'll get overseas or with a machine or AI in some way, shape, or form. What you just described sounds to me a lot like uh, if somebody needs – if you're going to have a business and, you, and you, you want all those things out of an employee or even a business partner, that culture is probably at the top of the list. Talk a little Absolutely. bit about – Right. I mean, if you don't have the culture there, who's going to buy into everything that you just talked about? Talk about what, what it means to have and, and to foster that kind of culture. Well, that's the issue, right? When it comes to hiring and firing, I bring it up all the time. As a general rule, there's a good general rule, and that is hire slow, fire fast. And when you're hiring, while you know, skill set matters, I don't want to push away skill set. Credentials matter, but fit is far more important. It's not even close. I mean, fit is number one. I will get, I'll train you, I'll teach you, I'll figure other stuff out. 
But if you don't fit in my corporate culture, you're going to fail anyway. And a bad hire, I mean, that's a year of pain from one bad hire. So why in the world would I not worry about fit? And what fit means is you fit in my corporate culture, whatever that is. How do I know what that is? I create new mandates. I create new missions. I create new visions. I create new core values internally. I don't hire somebody, which is what most people do, is they hire people and say, we need a mission. We need values. Let's hire someone, and here's $10,000 and give it to us. And they do. Or if you're a big business, you hire McKinsey for half a million or a million dollars, and they give you utter garbage that just validates what you already thought. Um, but if you're not doing that, instead, you actually go internally. You start asking people what matters. How does it work? You start doing those types of things to create your own internal corporate culture. And then you do a lot of internal branding. And one of the best examples of that is from my, I, you know, my days as a Marine. If you go into any military base, what you'll find, like, uh, for example, in a military uh, base, I mean, in a Marine Corps camp, is you'll find Marine Corps stuff everywhere. USMC on the wall, Eagle, but anchor this, and a flag here, all over the place. Why? Did I all of a sudden forget I was a Marine? Of course not. I didn't walk by and go, oh, right, a Marine, I forgot. That doesn't happen. What am I doing? Internal branding. This is who you are. This is what's expected. This how, is how it works. Corporate culture is no different. You have to constantly reinforce what, what are your core values? What is your actual mission? Why the hell are you getting up in the morning? Why does it matter? The second you start talking about, you know, someone has the right credentials and they can do the job, you're telling them that it's only about nine to five. You know, the, the, the sad part is many people talk about things like, you know, it's about, you know, hourly work. Let's get $15 per hour minimum wage. It's about, you know, the value of labor. The value of labor is less and less and less. The idea that someone thinks that, well, I showed up so I should get paid, that guy is a dinosaur. They still exist. But boy, is it a problem. The comet is already on its way and they haven't figured this out yet. The reality of it is you have to have more of an entrepreneurial mindset, which is I need to be paid for the value that I bring. How do I know what value did I bring? My corporate culture tells me what it values, and that's what I bring. Am I bringing value to my customers, internal or external? When you have those conversations, and it's a very simple conversation you can have with your team, do it on a, on a quarterly basis, and you will watch the culture just happen around you. Yeah, I, that's the you know one of the things I try to we try to uh, go over and over again and, and give. Uh, we have a lot of college listeners, college age listeners that are they have they're aspiring to be architects, real estate developers, contractors at some point in their lives, and so they're very bright eyed and everything. And that's what that's what we preach over and over again is you need to you need to look valuable to to an employer and don't try to fool yourself with how it works in particularly my industry is that you need to you need to make that that company money um, and they need to be able to turn that money making machine on which is you almost instantly by the time you get into the get into the firm and, and or the company. Um, so speaking of that, and a lot of people yeah, I hire are... The problem is, though, you know, how do you know what making money looks like if you've never had a job? Right. It's a challenge, right? You don't know yeah. what making money looks like. And if you've gone to college, college does a terrible job of that. The amount of times that I've had to break people from their college habits is embarrassing. College habits are terrible. You know, college is all about passing a test. No one cares about that when you get out. Um, college is all about having the right answer. Nobody cares about when you get out. College is all about having a lot of data. That's what Google's for. I mean, mm -hmm. this stuff doesn't matter. These are things that, are, that really are important in school and have almost no value in the real world. And that's a big problem. It is a big problem. And I, but I think, I, you know, one of the things that I think maybe a college student could do is maybe start freelancing. Like start your own little side gigs. Understand understand how to negotiate with somebody when you're going out and saying, "Hey, I want to paint your house," or you know stuff like that. Uh, uh, as a college student can do. Um, Absolutely. While they're in school, yes. While they're in school, yes, exactly. A hundred percent. Look, I have a daughter who's fifteen. She already does logos. Yeah. When, uh, yes, how did, already. How did she How did she start that? I told her to do my logo, and I gave her clients. She nice. Started doing it. <laughs> yes. Already already there doing it. Yeah, yes. there's no better way to do it. I know it. Yeah, my, my kids, my two, I have, I have three boys and one girl, and uh, two of the boys, we made, we, 
I, we helped them launch a business one summer, and it was called Two Bros Who Mow. And so they, would just, they, had, they had two mowers, and they would go around, and they had to learn how, how to negotiate and understand, like, okay, how long is it going to – how much do I think my time is worth? How big is the lawn? How much should I charge? How do I convince this person that they should pay me? Then I need to follow up with them. There's no better way to teach entrepreneurship and, and business skills, I think, than on the ground, right? I mean, you're going to learn the you're going to learn the nuts and bolts. Well, not the nuts and bolts, but like the data that you talked about in school. But to me, that's that's about it. But um, there's something else here, though. You know, it doesn't mean everyone has to be an entrepreneur. It means they have to have an entrepreneurial mindset, which means taking ownership. Taking ownership of your job. You can still be an employee and have an entrepreneurial mindset, meaning I'm not just looking at showing up at 9 and leaving at 5. I'm looking at this is my job. Am I getting better at it? Is this job bringing more value? How valuable am I? That's how you want to start thinking, even if you just you know, don't ever want to have your own business. You just you want to be an employee. That's no worry. I'm, people can be employees. I don't have a problem with that. But if they're thinking things like, well, he owes me because I showed up, they're never going to go far. Yeah, totally. What do you think about uh, – so <clears throat> I hire a lot of, a lot of millennials, and it, you, know, you, you hear all these, see all these articles, all these headlines about, well, they're, they're, a, they're a unique animal, and they, they need all these different kinds of uh, – you need to curtail your business towards them or, or, or not. Do you have any experience with that in, from employers asking for you advice? Here's the thing to remember about millennials. They will always say things like, millennials are no good, or they want this. Right. Now, here's the thing to remember. It's very simple. Millennials care more than anything about two things, community and purpose. That's it. Remember those two words, community and purpose. If you don't give them community and purpose, they will be unhappy. They won't know why, because they're not savvy enough, because they're young. So they'll think that there's a hole. They won't know how to fill that hole. So they'll try to fill it with money. That doesn't work. If you actually do bend and give them more money, they're still unhappy. And they want more money. Or if you give them more power, whatever you give them, they want community and they want purpose. The difference between them and someone like me, I'm a Gen Xer. If I don't get community and purpose, I'll still stay. I'll just be a little bit unhappy and I'll find community and purpose someplace else. Uh, if I'm a baby boomer. Community and purpose is not at the job. That's someplace else. Uh. But, if I'm, but if I'm... If I'm a millennial, my work is my community and purpose, and if I don't get it there, I will leave. I will go back home to mom and live in the basement, or go, if I live in the city, I'll go and have six roommates as long as I have my Netflix password, I'm sorry, that I stole from someone else, and I have my laptop, <laughs> I'm good. That's all I yeah. care about. I will leave. So if yeah. you want to keep millennials happy, do that. How do I know this? Look at millennials in nonprofits. They work insane. They will work 20 hours straight, sleep under the desk, don't shower, sadly, get back up and get back to work. When they have community, when they have purpose, you will get a lot out of them. Your goal is to create those two things. You will keep your millennials happy. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm an, uh, I'm not quite a Gen X. I'm probably, according to the statistics, two years off, so I'm like an older millennial. And that's exactly what we've tried to do at our firm is yep. create a culture where it's it's fun. We play hard. We work hard. Um, but all of those things happen. And, and so far, it's paid dividends. We've only had one person so far leave due to uh, circumstances where they felt like there, there wasn't a community. But it wasn't because of the inside the firm community. It was because of externalities and stuff like that. So I, I just couldn't agree more. I think your analysis of all those generations was spot on. So yep. good stuff. Um, do you have any experience? <clears throat> so this is a, primarily a lot of architecture listening to this podcast. Do you have any experience at all with um, with architecture firms or design firms and the, sure. the red and the red tape that they have to deal with in New York City? Can you tell us any any of those, any any stories that come to mind about that? I literally teach leadership to the Department of Buildings in New York City. Oh, seriously? Literally? Yes. Correct. I literally just, yes. It's it's a, it's a big problem, of course. I mean. I don't know what, what do you want me to say. I mean, I could I could sit there and cry with you for a while. I mean, what do you want me to do? <laughs> well, one thing is, uh, can you speak about because I've heard this and I just want a confirmation. I don't know if you know about this, but I can't remember which mayor of of New York City passed this law where you get a if you if you once you submit for a building permit as an architect, if you don't if you haven't got the building permit 
if it hasn't been issued within like 60 days or something, this is like one of the few good pieces of legislature that seems to come out it's of that accurate. place. It's accurate, yes. It, I think it's 45 that? days. 45 days, something like that. Yes, that, yeah. that was brilliant. And look, here's the remember about New York City. While there's lots of red tape and there's a lot of stuff, something to remember, you know, New, York, New York has been making a lot of mistakes recently. And one of them is we've pushed uh, all the new technologies out of New York State. And in the past, it didn't matter that much. But in the past 20 years, particularly, maybe even 30, but clearly the last 20, finance follows tech. That wasn't the case in the past. In the past, tech followed finance. Now finance follows tech. So as we push all the tech out of our, out of our state, the finance companies are leaving. They're all going to the places. They're going to uh, San Francisco. They're getting out of here, and they're leaving. Well, now, for the first time ever in New York, in New York State, finance is not our biggest lobby. Our biggest lobby now is real estate. So when lobby, the real estate's your biggest lobby, you tend to do what real estate says. So yes, in New York State, things have to get built. We are basically a communist, uh, uh, New York State is basically a communist city. Mm-hmm. So with that in mind, if they followed just all the rules, nothing would get built in New York City. Nothing. So instead, they passed the rule that said, if it's not, I think it's 45 days. If you don't get your permit in 45 days, it's approved. And that's amazing. <laughs> yes. That's one of the Otherwise, only good things they've done. <laughs> that's correct. New York, New York City has done probably 99 things that are horrible. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. I, but yeah, they did I it not because they care. They did it because if they didn't, the real Nothing people would, wouldn't, get, wouldn't give them money. Right. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you guys are like the, uh, the, case, the, the, the perfect case study for rent control and how that has all played out. And how do you no, no. You, all that stuff was great. Are you kidding me? We're, we're, we're talking about moving towards, I mean, great. I mean, great for big business. Right. To, we're moving towards having, having to have a, a, a landlord license. We're making yeah. sure that if you're a small landlord, you're finished. Oh, the seriously? The only people yeah. who will be able to do anything are big developers, big landlords. Right? Mm-hmm. We now have a rule in New York City where if someone um, doesn't pay rent, you can't evict them for a year. Wow. Yes. So if you have 400 units, who cares? Not just right. that. If you have 400 units, you and I know this, and you don't have to agree with this, but you and I know this. You have a real estate company um, that runs everything, right, um, uh, um, um, a management company, and they have thugs that make the life miserable for the person who doesn't pay. Uh, you don't have to agree with that. You, we just know that's true. And so you have that. So that person will eventually just buy their way out or you negotiate and they'll leave. But what if you only have two units and that person, and, and you're the landlord yourself, and that person doesn't pay for a year? You don't have any thugs. If you do anything, you get arrested. So what happens? You lose your property. You got to be Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. So yeah, Anytime there's any, any kind of intervention like that, it always plays out for the people with the, with the most money at the top, and it's, it's pure protectionism, right? Pure protectionism. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. And, yeah. You and know, they're probably doing something more and more that way. Right. That's too bad. Uh, all right, switching gears. <clears throat> so since you've mentored you know, other business owners, a lot of entrepreneurs, what is your best small business success story? Somebody that you've talked with, and then they just kind of exploded or taken off or taken a big right turn and went the right way. It's a great question. Um, I have a couple of them. Probably, probably one of them. I don't. I don't want to say the name because I. Don't, uh, That's okay. The yeah. About what the thing about what I do, which I found out was a big problem, is a lot of people didn't want to give me referrals because I was their secret weapon. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to. They don't. They want to make it look like it's all them, and they don't right. want to know that they have a coach. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's, that's a hard part for me, if that makes any sense, which is why I do a lot of training also. Yeah. Um, but, yes, I've had, I think, two people who literally lost their job, then started a small consulting firm, and took off to have over two dozen um, employees. Very cool. All, all, and all one because... of them brought me back to train their employees. Groovy. And, and so has it just been like a product base? Like they were just purely consulting about you know marketing, something like that? Almost all services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the wor- what about the worst? Uh, do you have do you have one where you're like, there's no saving this person, or you know, and, and, and absolutely yeah. a lot of those. Remember something: when most people want coaching, they actually don't want to do better; they just want to feel better. Seriously, is that a psychological oh, yeah. thing? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Remember something: most coaches suck. 
<laughs> Terrible. I agree. Freaking I agree. useless. I mean, useless. But that's okay. They still survive because people don't actually want to get better. They just want to feel better. So they yeah. basically hire the coach so the coach can go, you can do it. You're amazing. You're awesome. And that's what they do, and they feel better, and that's that. And they're going to they're gonna fail anyway, but they feel better as they fail. I get approached by a business coach at least once a week. And yeah. And usually my, my biggest question for them is, and so I'm, this isn't me talking to you, Larry. This is me talking to somebody else. My first question to them usually, because I'm, I'm a successful entrepreneur, and my question to them is, uh, well, tell me about all your businesses that you started and, and been successful about. And they, yeah. they, yeah, they usually don't have one. <laughs> yeah, like, well, well, more importantly, what, what about the one that failed? Because that's when you learn the most. Yeah, yeah. My, my oh. MBA was my first failed business. Why do you say that? Because that's when I learned how to actually run a business. Mm -hmm. When I started my first business, I knew how to sell, and I thought that's all that mattered. Right. But I had no idea how to set pricing, how to do admin, how to deal with finance. I didn't even know how to set my own schedule effectively. I had no idea. I knew how to be a sales rep, and I was good at being a sales rep, but that's all I knew. I thought that's all that matters. I didn't understand that you could actually go out, make sales, come back at the end of the month, and have no profit. I didn't get that. I learned that the hard way by failing in the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was my MBA. That's how I learned how to hire people, fire people, get screwed over, contract work. Right. The hard way. That was my MBA. People ask me all the time, Larry, should I get an MBA? And I say, what do you want to do? And they say, I want to start a business. Why would you get an MBA? <laughs> what do you tell them then? Do what? What do you, you going to do? No, yeah. start a business. You're going to drop yeah. $100,000 and throw two years away on an MBA to, 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 to learn crap you're never going to use and, and on top of it, to break any creativity you might have had. What do you tell people when the next – one of the next things I bet they tell you is they say, I bet they say, well, I don't have any money, Larry. Everybody else has money when they start a business. What do you tell them when they say that? Well, there's two things. No, the first, let me finish the MBA piece. So instead of going to the MBA, take that same $100,000 and start a business. Yeah. And when that business fails – now you have an MBA and experience. Absolutely. Now you, are, now you got both, and now you know what'll work next time, because you just mm -hmm. test it out to what was going to happen. So they don't have yeah. the money. Two things: number one, go raise some money, or two, start a business without money. As a general rule, start a business online. Online is the cheapest way of starting a business. It is cheap. Yep, yeah. exactly. One of the books I always recommend is the Lean Startup. I mean, they, 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 he goes through all of these beautiful app, you know, especially now with all the applications you have available at your fingertips, the way you can easily build a website, you have all the social media reach, uh, you can have a virtual office, right? I, I don't buy the excuse that you, you, you need a lot of money to start. We started our business with, with basically a thousand dollars in our pocket. Yep. Uh, you know, we've grown into a multi-million dollar conglomerate. So yep. that, that excuse I just don't buy from people. I'm with you. Um, what if you're, so going back to one thing you were kind of getting at was, <clears throat> so we're in a post, we're in a post industrial society. And that's one thing that's kind of drives me nuts about these politicians that, you know, they always make these claims that we're going to bring back manufacturing and stuff. So what is your take on automation and the effect that will have on small businesses, AI, that sort of thing? What do you, where, where do you think, uh, is it an advantage, disadvantage? Should we be worried about the jobs? Where are we at? I bring it up all the time. Um, people talk about if you're, generally speaking, in politics now, there's one or two boogeymen. Either it's all oh, those immigrants coming or it's the evil corporations. It's one of those two, depending upon what side of the political spectrum you're on. Yeah, and both yeah. are wrong. Both are wrong. The biggest thing affecting us right now is automation, AI, without question. That's the biggest thing. And it's bad for only one reason. We're not ready for it. That's why it's bad. Not that it in itself is bad. Automation and AI in itself is very good for us. We're going to be much more productive. The problem is we haven't figured it out, and we don't want to figure it out, and we're ignoring it. Because as usual, we have pushed ourselves and we're holding ourselves to the old ways, and we're not moving forward. That's the problem, right? L look at the finance world, which, of course, being in New York City, I see it. All the guys getting laid off. Because AI is way better at trading, way better at, at, at uh, um, analyzing stuff, and faster, and doesn't ask for a bonus. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Doesn't ask for a bonus. So yeah. Never so had to, never had any lawsuits problem. against it, any stuff like that. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, so it's it's a, it's a big deal. But not just that. Look at the, the, the number one job for a male in the United States is driver. Mm hmm And you see driverless cars coming up. 
the number one for a female is server or clerk. And you see all the kiosks coming up. Mm -hmm. There's going to be massive, a massive displacement coming up in the next 10, 20 years. Massive. And how it's going to be pushed is by people trying to control it, right? Here's the problem. As people start, uh, as that labor I talked about, that is becoming less and less valuable, governments are trying to force the value of it. You know, we need a $15 minimum wage or a $20 minimum wage, or the case may be. Big business is on board. They're like, yes, that's a beautiful idea. Let's do $15 an hour. Let's do 20 an hour. That's amazing. Why? They're ready. Literally, if you look at all the larger organizations, the kiosks are already there. They've been prepping us for the, the, the mechanization of retail for a long time. Most of us, that we, we do retail online anyway, and when mm-hmm. you don't go online, there's, there's no, you know, checkout with no, no body there, there's kiosks on the desks, there's kiosks in the room already, and in Europe, McDonald's even has the machines they even make the hamburgers already. They're ready. The problem yeah. is who's not ready? Is the small guy is not ready. They can't afford to buy one of those machines. McDonald's is going to buy, you know, 7,000 of those machines at one pop at a massive discount. Bob's Diner is going to cost him three times as much. He can't afford it. Bob's Diner can't afford to upgrade everything. He's finished. So you're going to watch the massive increase of the, of the large big box and or franchise explode. And, of course, where there were seven people in that store, now there's going to be two and one tech person. Or maybe you one and one tech person. And that's it. And we're still going to be doing the same things. So also going to be displaced. I'm yeah. not um, uh, a Yang. Um, uh, is it Yang? Yeah, Yang fan. Uh, yeah. The guy who's the president. However, I'm happy about one thing. His UBI idea at least talks about the idea of automation being the issue. And, and at least how we deal with it. Yep. And how to use as follows. We shouldn't be afraid of it. I look at the example uh, when it comes to automation uh, in the past, any technology, right? If you look at technology in the past, when, say, a horse was technology, right? When a horse was technology, uh, a farmer is plowing his field. Some guy says, hey, Bob the farmer, use his horse. Puts the horse on. Wow, that's great. The technology is better than me. Well, what's better than the horse? Me guiding the horse. So me accepting the new technology and guiding it is what makes technology even better. The best example for AI is look at chess. When I was a kid in the 70s, my dad had taught me how to play chess. And when the original chess computers came out, I could actually beat the test computers in the 70s. That quickly went away. <laughs> Soon, I couldn't beat the computers anymore. And then only chess masters could beat the computers. Then eventually, chess masters got beat by the computer every time. So what beats a computer now? Chess master plus computer. That's how yeah. it always works. That's we how it always works. Able... Go ahead. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you, Larry, uh, and, and, and that's one analogy we try to make at the, on, on this podcast in our firm is that there's a piece of software that <clears throat> basically made it, it, allowed, it made it allowed us to be like four draftsmen at one time, yep. and we, we just stayed ahead of it. We knew it was on the horizon, and now we're always keen because we took that and we used that technology. What we were able to do is we were able to outcompete the other architecture firms um, by being volume based instead of high percentage base. So we were able to take on more work, provide a service for less money, but still maintain that same profit line that other architecture firms would do. And now we have a more stable firm. So I'm with you. I, I think that's the silver lining of it is like, why are you not embracing it? I think you need to take all of these little tools that are coming out like email automation, where, you, where it's sort of predicting like how you would respond to clients, all of those kinds of things and making them happen and embracing it. And then just going like, yeah, it's going to reduce the number of people I need, but if I'm the person who is has an entrepreneurial mind and I'm the one taking the risk and I'm the one starting the business, then that's where you can capitalize at 100%. But not even just that. I mean, this is the point I'm bringing up, right? We want to embrace it. So even if I'm not the entrepreneur, but I'm the architect or mm-hmm. I'm the real estate manager or I'm the, you know, I'm the whatever, insert thing here, I should be saying to myself, I have to keep learning. So when this new thing comes out and I see it on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or wherever I see it or my friends talk about it or I go to the, you know, I go to the trade association event when they discuss it, why am I not at that point then learning it immediately, not waiting for my company to teach me, Mm -hmm. but learning it on my own so that 
I now know what it is. So when it happens, I'm like, I'm here. Again, I'm not the entrepreneur. I'm just the guy who does the, the, the work. But now you come to me and you say, hey, Larry, do you, you know, do you want to work for my firm? I go, sure. I already know the new cool thing, and I can get behind it. And you're like, yeah. you're my guy. Yep. And if I'm hiring you, Larry, I'm going, great. This guy is going to catapult us ahead of the other firm who didn't hire Larry and, and got us ahead of the curve. Right? So now Bingo. we're again ahead of the curve. Yep, exactly. That's exactly so that's how my I think. point about being entrepreneurial, which means you instead of saying I'm mad at this technology, it's understanding that we have to keep learning. If we don't learn, we're going to suffer. Except that's true. Yep, I know. I know. It's hard yeah, that's even hard for me to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I, I went to seven years of school. We learned so many pieces of software, some I don't even use anymore, and yep. it's like, oh, so I got to learn more. But yes. honestly, honestly, that's why I kind of that's why I pointed to, well, I'm just going to hire a Larry who's going to learn it, and then he'll catapult my firm. Yeah, um, but hold so, on. Even if you decide to hire a Larry, what mm -hmm. are you learning? You're learning new soft skills. Right. So you may not be learning hard skills anymore. But now you're learning soft skills. Now you're learning, how do I talk to guys like Larry? How do I mm -hmm. talk to, you know, a millennial who's new versus a Gen Xer who's not, right? How do I make that happen? So you may, you may not learn the hard skills anymore, but you'll still learn soft skills. Right, right, right. And be able to, and be able to, to, to you know, go between that, that person and somebody who doesn't have that sort of, uh, you know, skill set. Yeah. I always I, say when it comes to leaders, you got to worry about what I call the MTP. Mentor, train, plan. Those are the things you're working about. Mentoring, training, planning. Mm -hmm. Those are the soft skills you got to start working on. Yeah, yeah. Well, hey, uh, how about, uh, switching gears, if um, <clears throat> I want to ask you, if someone is starting up a new business tomorrow, 2019, yeah. what is one piece of advice you'd give them? The tough one. <laughs> no, <laughs> <Only> one. <laughs> um, it's one piece of advice, but it's two things. It's two things. It is work on two things, brand and niche. Mm -hmm. That's what I would tell you. Your brand is more important than anything else, and brand is not your logo. Brand is the emotion or feeling that people get when they interact with your marketing and or operations. So work on that. Number one, because brand will validate your price. Brand will also um, make the sales process easier or faster. And if you niche effectively, your message can be, can be stronger and closer and tighter and more believable so you can begin to gain and draw on revenue. Focus on revenue first. Focus on profit later. First, get stuff through your system, even if it's not good uh, a good business because as it moves through your system, you'll see the holes in your system and mm -hmm. you can repair them faster, then work on profit. So I would yeah. work on operations secondary because operation can make it more efficient. Get stuff moving through your process first, focus on brand and niche marketing, and then move on from there. Beautiful. How about this? If someone already has a seasoned business but wants some advice, uh, what is one piece you give them? Yeah, um, I would say immediately do an org chart of your of your job. If you're the owner of the business, uh -huh. do an org chart, not of your company, of your actual job, meaning what you do. Is it your job is a company on its own? And do an org chart of what you do either in a given week or a given month, depending on how many transactions you do. If you're more of a retail type business where it's a lot of transactions, it might even be daily. If you're more of one who, you know, you do, a, you do only large transactions, maybe several a year, it might be monthly, but you pick on what you do, do an actual org chart of what your, your monthly or weekly business, I mean, um, work is. Look at that org chart. Once you draw it out, create, you know, this is my admin responsibility. This is my leadership responsibility. This is my sales responsibility. This is, you know, my operation responsibility. Here's my financial responsibility. This is what I do. Here's every single thing I do. Look at that and then say to yourself, what has the most impact, what has the least impact? Then look at yourself and say that same thing and say, 
what do I spend the most time on, what do I spend the least time on, then look at it and say, what, am I, what do I enjoy the most, what do I not enjoy the most, and lastly, what am I good at, what am I not good at. You do that for your own job, you will see how inefficient you are, how ineffective you are, decide if you want to actually rehire, change, shift, uh, change what you're doing, change how effective you are. That would be really more effective. Yeah, I think that would be really sobering to a lot of people, honestly, even me. Because yep. you get caught up. I mean, it's, it's hard enough. You're, every day you wake up. You know, one of the things I say is not true. I wake up starving. I'm hungry every day. Yep. I don't have any money. I'm broke. Even though I do, yep. I'm fine. <laughs> yep. That's the mindset, right? And so you get caught up in that. But having having that kind of mirror effect, I think it, it, it can do – you can, it can go right to your soul as an entrepreneur and kind of make you, you know, shift and change gears and then refocus. So I love that. All right, last, last one. What are three pieces of advice you give to all entrepreneurs? Um, several things. Um, one of them is you're saying someone who's already up and running. Yes. All right. If you're already up and running, um, the first thing is schedule downtime. Literally. Schedule downtime. If you don't schedule downtime, you have, you will very often either get burned out or start ignoring personal relationships that are really important to you and you don't realize how important they are until it's too late. So, it can't work. You can't work all the time. It's you just, can't, yes. You can't do it. Yeah. But, but as, as you said, if you're on Twitter, you're often hungry, so you mm-hmm. kind of want to work all the time. In fact, that's where you feel most comfortable. Right. So schedule your off time or down time or schedule it. Even if necessary, schedule sleep time if, if it's that bad for you. But <laughs> seriously. I'm not I know. I, I'm joking because it's true. I mean, I'm yes. laughing because it's true. I know yes. people like that. There's a, there's a young man that I mentored. Uh, he, went, he, was a, he was a student of ours, and he, he's so impressed with himself that he works 100 hours a week. And I'm going, that's not, you're, not, you're not living, man. You gotta, yep. you, you gotta have a life. You have to have a life. You have to have that break. Otherwise, otherwise, um, I just think you you start to burn out and you start to you start to lose track of of, of what's what's the priority in life and what the really what the real goal is. You know. So, yep. what's another one? Um, second thing is, come up with a crystal clear three year goal. Crystal clear three year goal. And I mean, look three years out and say, what do you physically see you are, every aspect of what you are, your business, what is it? Come with that three-year goal. And then ask yourself, are you actually marching towards it or are you not? Mm -hmm. And if you are, awesome, but you probably aren't. You're probably getting caught up in day-to-day. You're probably getting caught up in other things. So are you actually marching? You don't, the, the sad part for most businesses once they get started is most businesses aren't actually being run. They're run by inertia. And you don't want your business being run by inertia. Right. Right. And you want some lead. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, because then there's no leader. There's no lead there. There's no square head. There's no target, right? Yes. And the problem is if you are successful, the odds are very high that you will become complacent. Mm-hmm. It's very common. Yeah. So come up with that three year and go, you know what? That's where I want to be. That's what I want to see. And are you marching? If you are, life is good. But if you're not, what are you doing wrong? Mm-hmm. And the last sure. thing is, whatever you're doing, give up more power. I love it. I love that one. That was one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten from anybody. Uh, yep. if, uh, another one is, it's, it's, it, you didn't say it exactly like he did, but what he told me is, you need to figure out how to replace yourself. If yep. you're, you're, you're not an entrepreneur if you don't figure out how to replace yourself. And no, otherwise, you, what you do is you own your job. Yep. I don't exactly. want you to own your job. Me neither. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want you to entrepreneur. And remember, I'm a Marine. So I, I naturally, I'm doing it in many things in my life. But I always remember one, one thing is, if I, as a Marine, you have to set it up to where if you get shot, they can still take the hill. Right. Right. My business partner will love that. He listens, Do you ever listen to Jocko Willick? I have, uh, no. Yeah, have you heard of him? Oh, you, you, you'd like him. He's, he's, a, he's, a, uh, he's a Navy SEAL, so he's not a Marine, but... Uh, you know, Almost pretty cool. popular. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he, he preaches extreme ownership, and you've you talked about that too several times. So uh, this will resonate well. 
Um, well, very cool, Larry. Thank you again for being on. Tell everybody where they can where they can follow you for any business advice, how they can keep getting touch Best with you. Best place to go is just go to LinkedIn and look for Larry Sharp on LinkedIn, or you can go to my YouTube page, The Neo Sage. Any T H E N E O S A G E, The Neo Sage YouTube page. Beautiful, awesome. Thanks, Larry. Well, I appreciate your time. As Have a good one. Does too. You too. And now, a word from one of our sponsors. Hey, everybody. If you are trying to learn Revit, I think you should learn from yours truly, Alex Gorenland Psycho. Uh, we have a website called RevitRocketShip.com. We've been training university students, other professionals, our own staff for many, many, many years, and we made it available uh, online at RevitRocketShip.com. And what's great about it is that it's broken down into five to seven minute chunks, plus or minus on some of them, um, teaches you everything from families uh, to uh, a whole project base. And one of the differentiators, I think, there's actually two major ones. One is we're an actual firm, uh, f9productions.com, that does a lot of work. So we are implementing practices that are true. And what that means is that we're modeling like it gets built. Uh, we're doing our, our walls a little bit different. You'll, you'll see in the videos of why we do it, but it actually works out in the end uh, to create a better model. We've uh, trained a lot of people, so this is not our first go around. And the other thing too is that you get our template. You, give the actu- you get the actual template that we use, hone, develop, and improve every year um, in that system. Uh, so it's for free. So if you were starting a residential pro- project, you'd start off on that. It'd have uh, everything set up the way that we like, the way that helps you uh, go faster, build cooler, cooler things, and, and be more awesome. So check that out, RevitRocketShip.com. 